Uh, yeah. Could you say maybe Anyanta? We said the right one when we do that. Hey, we'll talk when about we talk about Anyanta. Yeah. But there's your yeah, problem. Very nice. Yeah, no, it's very helpful to see. Like, uh, are you a big coffee drinker, Dr. Nagel? I've only in the last few years. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't drink coffee? Not usually, a little bit, but not uh, not very particularly. I'm only what? I'm a barista sometimes. Oh, wow. Well, maybe we'll, we'll stop by sometime. <laughs> Uh, and I asked my co-secretary for Shabbos, so he would say things. Some people do it, some people don't. So I wouldn't do it. You know, he wouldn't do it. He said, no, he said what some people say something. So that's what he said. But the pearl is no problem, right? Well, I mean, you have to... Well, I mean, first you have to accept the heter of Klish Lishi, you know, which, which not everybody does, but in America it's very common to accept. But... Um, but if you accept that, you know, like the same heter many rely on to make tea in the first place, then, um, then like we said, if you're pouring in water and you're getting water out, then we assume that's not a Maisa Brera. That, uh, based on that, that's Sugi and Shabbos, Kuflam and Ches. All right, we learn uh, Lilo Nishmas Yaakov Elimelech Ben Avraham Abba. Mr. Nagel's Neshama should have an Aliyah. Hope everybody is doing well. Um, great, let's jump right in. So we have a machshav piece. I'm sorry I, I didn't send it out. Please, I'll try to send it out right afterwards uh, or later this week. And we're in the process of transitioning from Rabbi Proops to we have a new office staff, Lisa. And um, Jacob has very kindly uh, offered to help out in terms of distributing things. So hopefully we'll have everything up and running again soon. But this week we have a piece from the Sefer Bat Ayin. Bat Ayin is a Sefer on the Parsha written by one of the Talmudim, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak Nibardichev who uh, he studied under Rebbe Yitzchak, and then he actually made Aliyah, he moved to Tzfat for later in his life. There's a famous story about the Bat Ayin and the Shul in Tzfat during the time of that, that earthquake, a terrible earthquake, that he and his Tamidim were saved um, in, in a somewhat miraculous way, way. He lived in the late 1700s, uh, early 1800s, 1760 to 1840. And so here he, he comments on another phrase in the Shabbos Amida. We've been looking at various... Uh, parts of the Shabbos davening. Can everybody hear me, by the way, on, on Zoom? Okay. okay. So we know one of the lines that we say repeatedly is, V'taher libenu la'avdecha be'emes, and purify our heart to be able to serve you honestly. And so the Basayan explains that a person needs to yearn and crave to be close to Hashem. A fiery desire should embody him and draw him close to the source of all life. He should long to reach the level where he can wholeheartedly feel a deep love and passion towards Hashem. This is what we daven for on Shabbos when we say, right? He should long and desire. Right? How can you, with all of your being, serve and love HaKadosh Baruch Hu? As Shabbos is very much about that longing for Hashem, that fiery longing. And uh, they bring from... Uh, another sefer, which was uh, written by Tamar Rabbi Yitzchak Elchanan Specter of Kavna, that um, a lot of times people do mitzvahs with ulterior motives, where we say, um, but we daven, they know we should do the mitzvahs with only a pure heart. Ki kol emes amiti belishum ta'aroves klau. We shouldn't have any other ulterior motives mixed in. And that's what we're davening for when we say, v'tahir libeinu lov dechad emes. And we specifically say this on Shabbos and Yantif. You might say, why not say it every day, right? Isn't that a good thing to have a pure heart every day? So say because on Shabbos and Yantif, we're free of all the mundane concerns. We have more of a time to be authentically our real selves. And uh, that's so important in our Avodah Hashem. And that's why Davka in those days, we, we say this line. And this idea of being our authentic selves, of asking HaKadosh Baruch Hu to purify us, uh, relates to this week's Parsha, they point out. Because as we know, Parsha Kisavo is famous for the mitzvah of Bikurim. Bikurim appears elsewhere in the Torah as well, but its most extensive treatment is in Parsha Kisavo. And uh, the Mishnayos, the Rambam, all paint a beautiful picture of the procession of the Bikurim, of what it was like. And we had a share, we gave a share on this a couple of years ago, of kind of vivid detail. What exactly was it like to bring Bikurim? But in short, the Mishnayos described that when a farmer's crop um, specifically of the Shiva Samini, Smachlokas, did Bikurim apply to other fruit as well? Meaning, could you optionally give from other fruit, but you had to give from the Shiva Samini, or it only applies to Shiva Samini as Machlokas in the Rishani, but we generally assume the Shiva Samini. 
So when you see the Shiva Semini beginning to grow, the farmer would enter his field and tie a little ribbon on the first fruit to blossom. And when the fruits ripen, he and his fellow farmers from the surrounding villages would set a date to bring the fruits to Yerushalayim. Any time, any time between Shavuos and Sukkos. That is the Gemara Darshan Zelf and Pasuk Vesamachta Lifnei Hashem Elokecha. It has to be Bisman Simcha when you're Mevi Vakore. During that time, you can bring Bikurim and say the Mikra Bikurim, the special passage. If you bring it after Sukkos, you're still allowed to bring it, but you're not allowed to say the passage, and you're allowed to bring it all the way until Hanukkah. And so the night before they'd go to bring it to Yerushalayim, they'd all gather together and sleep outside. When the sun rose, someone would proclaim, let us ascend to Yerushalayim. And the procession would begin with musical instruments, a flute, and an ox with gold-covered horns, all marching to Yerushalayim with the people carrying their baskets. And when they came to Yerushalayim, people would come out and greet them, and they would inform, uh, a messenger would inform the Kohanim of their arrival. The Kohanim would greet the farmers, escort them to the base Hamikdash. And then uh, we know that each farmer would get his turn to bring the fruit into the Azara, and uh, there was a certain service and a certain thing that they read. And then the question, of course, is why is all this necessary? Every year they would do the same ceremony of the Mikra Bikur, and they made such a big deal about I have, say, one fig in my basket. This one fig is a whole procession around celebrating this, this fig. You could bring more than one, but it technically could even just be one. So Lubavitcher, Lubavitcher Rebbe explains that not every basket of the farmers was the same, right? Some farmers had big and beautiful fruits, but for others, their first fruit was not very impressive at all, right? It didn't come out very nicely. And yet, every farmer was granted the opportunity to hold his basket in the Beis Hamikdash in front of all the elderly Kohani and to recite those verses while everyone else listened. And so in this procession, the Torah is teaching us an incredibly important idea that as long as the offering is yours, even if it's small, even if it's not beautiful, it's important and beautiful in the eyes of Hashem. And God doesn't want you to bring someone else's fruit. He wants you to bring what he blessed you with specifically, regardless of how beautiful it, it seems objectively. The Torah is teaching us the importance of you. And I say that's the Indian of the Bikurim, Vatar Levin, Love the Chab Yemes, right? That you're, on Shabbos, you bring the real you. The greatest gift you can give to HaKadosh Baruch Hu is your true undistorted self. And so that is perhaps the message of the Bikurim, the message of Shabbos, Vatar Levin, Love the Chab Yemes, a beautiful Kavana we can have now every time we say that line. Okay, uh, this week, hoping to finish up the Malacha of Borer. Maybe at the end, we said, uh, at the end of all of our Lima, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about it. But um, hoping to finish up the, the main points of Borer. And then to begin Simon Shin Chaf. Shin Chaf is the last Simon that we cover for this Bechina, which is uh, primarily talking about the Halachas of squeezing, of Tisha, squeezing Sritas Peros on Shabbos, squeezing berries and the like, fruit, which you'll see is very practical as well in terms of how we do that. So, um, is there something I wanted to ask? Any questions, by the way, on anything we've done until now? Let's say from last week or previous weeks. Okay. So, last week you might remember, and again, I apologize for those who didn't get to hear last week yet. The recording hasn't been posted yet. Uh, or I think it was posted, but it didn't work, uh, I heard. So, we'll, uh, we'll see. Um, but we talked about the Machlokis, the Mugin Avram, and the Shulchan Aruch Harav. Seems to be a Machlokis, right? About how do you define what is being removed when we talk about Borer? Sometimes it's obvious. I have a mixture of two things and I take one out. But what I'm taking is the taken item and what I'm leaving behind is what's left behind. But sometimes it's not so simple. Let's say I have a mixture of two things and I pour out some, right? I have the sediment and the liquid together and I pour off the liquid. Is pouring off the liquid called... Uh, I'm taking the thing that the sediment that's there and I'm pouring off the liquid or no pouring off liquid means I'm taking the liquid and I'm leaving behind the sediment. How do you view what is being taken and what is being left behind is a matter of perspective. And we saw that the consensus of most post is like the Magen Avram, that if you have something and you're pouring it off, then pouring it off, that's what you're taking out of the mixture. And if that's the case, that would have tremendous ramifications. For example, in the realm of tuna. Right, if you have tuna fish on showers, remember we discussed opening a tuna can, but now that you've opened it, if you want to drain out, let's say you want to hold down the lid and you just want to pour off some of the, the liquid that's on top of the fish. So first of all, if you're talking about liquid that's way above the fish, is that going to be a problem to pour off? No, because that, exactly, that's not the mixture. Exactly, that's above the interface of the two things. So that's okay. But now as you're pouring a little bit more and you're getting really close to the line between the fish and the liquid, so if we're going to assume that's a mixture, which by the way, not all posts can do, 
But if we assume that that is considered a mixture of liquid and fish, so then I'm pouring off the liquid and down the drain of my sink. That means I'm taking out the bad, the undesired, and leaving behind the good. That violates rule number one of Borer. So according to this opinion, it would be a problem to do that. Rather, you should try to scoop the tuna out rather than pouring the, the water out. Again, not everybody agrees to that. Some, some are lenient, but I think that the common custom is to try to do that. Same thing with uh, if you have yogurt with a little bit of liquid on top, as is written in source number 53 of the Shemir Shabbos Kehilchus, which I, I think we, we discussed that last week. Another example where this comes up, almost the same thing, but just to spell it out, that they bring in the notes is, what if you have a, a ladle of soup that, uh, you know, you chick picked up a Friday night some chicken soup in the ladle, and it has a matzo ball, and let's say all you want is the matzo ball, you don't want any chicken soup. So am I allowed to pour out the chicken soup back into the pot, so I'm left with the dry matzo ball that I want? So what do people think? Ah, oh, so that could be one eight. So Mark says, take some soup together with it, and then you, you're taking the mixture, like we said, for the Chazanish, you want to take a little bit more, perhaps. For Mishnah Bura, you could take a little bit less, but uh, that would be one eight. Huh? But if you really want to have just the, the matzah ball, not any soup, so in theory, first of all, you have to determine, is this a mixture or not? So that, again, would depend seemingly on the size of the matzah ball, or the size of the chicken in the soup. As we've seen, sometimes we call that a mixture, sometimes we call, say it's not a mixture, it's not always clear. But if we'll assume that a matzo ball and the chicken soup are considered the mixture in your ladle, so there really it would be a problem, right, according to the Magen of Rome, to pour out the soup and just keep the matzo ball, because I'm taking the bad and leaving the good. That's called taking the soup, the thing that's poured out, and leaving behind the matzo ball, what I want, and now it'd be a problem. And so how would we get around that? So the two very simple, uh, simple answers, uh, solutions that the post can give. One is if you pour out the entire contents of the ladle, and then again, try to just remove the chicken, like take a fork now to just pick up the matzo ball from the soup rather than a ladle. That, that's one easy way to get just the matzo ball without any liquid. Or the other option, which is an important chiddush, is let's say there's someone else at your table who wants the soup. So I have a ladle that has soup and matzo ball in it. So if I, we said, if I pour out the soup because I want the matzo ball, that's violating rule number one of Bora. That's a big problem. But what if I pour out the soup to someone else who wants the soup? Well, now for him, the soup is called ochel. For me, it was considered psoles. It was the thing that I did not want. For this person, it's called ochel, and uh, that seemingly should be okay. So if I... You know, vegetables or celery from your chicken soup and giving it to your wife because you don't like it, but she does? Exactly. So that would, that would fall into the category. Excellent question of, I think that was mayor, of the... The vegetable now is the ochel because you're giving it to them. For them, it's considered ochel. So this is a very important point, right? That we, we've touched on it once before. But in the laws of Borer, ochel and psoles is somewhat relative in terms of obviously for you, but it also depends on other people. And if one man's garbage is another man's treasure, right? Ochel and psoles can vary depending on the person. And that's, that's significant. Remember, anybody remember where else we saw this discussion? This is man in a different malacha about do we look at the person who's doing the malacha, or do we look at the person who the malacha is being done for, just for the sake of Chazar? Anybody remember? I, I know it's a little bit of a vague or tenuous connection, but I, I'm just bringing it up to remind ourselves. We have a malacha, and we say, do, when, do the criteria of the malacha, are they dependent on the mindset of the person who's doing it, or the person who's having it done for him? Isn't it if you have dust on a jacket, and the dust doesn't bother them, but it bothers you, excellent. then they can brush both, it off? Both, excellent. Exactly. Both, both are, are correct. And what Ruben said was from Lazman when it came to Muktza, where we discussed this. Of how you know a Muktza la Anim, how Muktza la Ashirim. Remember we discussed it. For one person, it's totally unusable, but for another person, it is usable. So you have a cloth that's you know three fingers wide by three fingers wide. It's excellent. So that that was one area we saw this subjective definition. And do we look at the owner of the house, or do we look at the guests in terms of if something they would use or they wouldn't use? Excellent. And then, but I was thinking of from this one is what Adam said is remember when it came to Malaban, I just bring this up for sake of Chazara, not because it's relevant to what we're discussing. But exactly, we said dry cleaning, what we call dry cleaning. So we said one of the criteria that everybody agrees you have to have in order to violate Malaban, if there's no liquid involved, you're just dusting it off, is it has to be a hakpada, you have to be makbi. That has to be, I wouldn't wear this normally, I don't like the appearance, but now I'd wear it because I'm dusting it off. That's fixing the garment, that's called cleaning it. In some, according to Ashkenazim, right? We saw the Machlok, it's Rashi and Tosos, and Kufmem Zayin. And so 
we had the, the suffix the bear halacha. He said, well, what if somebody's wearing a jacket and someone else dusts off his jacket? Let's say the parent doesn't like it, but the son, let's assume he's an adult, he, he doesn't care. So do we say that that's a problem of malabin or not? If the wearer isn't makbid, but the person dusting it off is makbid, do we, who's, who's dea do we follow? A little bit similar to here, not exactly the same, but who do we follow when we're defining ochel or psola? So we see if you're doing it for someone else, that can become ochel for, for that person. Okay, another important klal here, when we're talking about just the soup and the ladle, another uh, one of the last halachas we'll learn in Hilchos Borer, is in source number 54, the Orcha Shabbos writes, that it says, this idea of borer is bedafka if we are removing psolas from ocha. But the Orcha Shabbos writes here in source number 54, avalim eno motziam, if he's not taking out psolas from the mixture, rak mezizosam, he's just moving them, mimakom lamakom betarovas, he's just moving it to another part of the pot, let's say, v'akol nishar ma'urav kibitchila, hareza motor. If everything is mixed together, but you're just pushing it to a different side, so let's say you want to push the vegetables to the side of the pot, or the chicken or the matzo ball to one side of the pot to be able to remove a different part of the mixture, that's going to be considered okay, right? The example they give also is like clothes in a dryer. Let's say, so we discussed last month, are you allowed to open a dryer on Shabbos? Is that considered muktza? Remember the issue of it being maybe a klisha malach to or assuming no light is going on, but from a muktza standpoint, are you allowed to move the door? If we assume that you are, so how do you, if you want to reach into the dryer, so I want to get to these particular socks. So I'm pushing other ones out of the way. Aren't you removing the psolas to get to the ocha? They say, no, that's not called removing anything. I'm just moving it to the side to be able to get to this. That's called uh, one mixture. And Yorcha Shabbos says that's not considered a problem. And he gives another interesting example. He says, Mutter is ha-machtechos ha hamaftechos ha-eferin Now let's say you're looking for a particular key on a key ring, on a keychain. Interesting thought. Many wouldn't have even thought that there's an issue of borer, but that's a mixture of keys. I'm going through them. Is there any problem of borer? I'm taking away the bad until I get to the good as I'm going through them. So say, no, that's not called taking away the bad because they're all still in the mixture, meaning they're all on that key ring. So borer means you take one out and you put it over here. If the keys are all still on that key ring, we're going to call that uh, not even borer doesn't get off the ground. There's no issue there at all. So that's an important thing. Uh, yeah, it seems like potentially that could be the, the issue. Would be if you remove a key, you want to remove the one that you want to use and to use it right away, Lichara. One could have argued that maybe that's not called a mixture. You know, you might have thought similar to books standing next to each other on a bookshelf where we said that according to Rosh Hashanah it's not a mixture. But here, the, the Pashtas, they're assuming that it is considered a mixture and therefore you'd want to take the one that you, you need to use. You want to take the one that you need to use also for a muktza purpose, again, for Chazar. Remember, we discussed tiltul min hatzad, right? That you can take the key that you want, even if there are muktza car keys on it. Better to take the muktza one off, we learned last month. But if you don't, it's okay, because you're dragging the muktza along by taking the non-muktza itself. Okay, very good. Um, okay, and then Reb Shlomo Zan goes a step further in source number 55, in Halich al-Shlomo. It's quoted, Ach gam yesh lomar. The kevan shehu nishar biyado, ve'enu meniach es ha-shivuros b'makam nifrad, ala machziran l'besof l'chavilazu, eno nikra borer. This is, what if you actually take something out of a mixture? So here, before, the Orch HaShav is just that you can push it to the side. I mean, I'm in the dryer and I'm pushing things to the side to get to what I want. That's not called taking away the bad. That's just called deflecting the bad within the mixture. But what if I actually take it out I'm going through the dryer and I'm taking out things so that I can get to the one that I want. And then I plan to put it back in. That we assume, Yerusha Shabbos says, would be okay. Oh, wow. Wonders of technology for Adam. So um, uh, is that considered to be a problem of borer or not? So Shlomo Zaman says no, that uh, because you keep it in your hand and you're going to put it back, that also is not called borer. Borer means taking the psolas out of the mixture and putting it down somewhere. But taking it, holding it, and putting it back, that is considered one act. And that's all right. And he gives a fascinating mushal. We're doing a lot of chazara tonight. That's like that the chillin. Like what? Like chillin. Like you said, like chillin. Very good. Just like chillin. He says it's just like chazara for those of us who learned the in Simon Shin Yorches, right? Or really Rashi and Gimel about uh, returning something to the fire. Remember, he said one of the conditions, at least for Ashkenazim, is it has to be odo biado. That you take it off, you take the pot off the fire, and you keep holding it. And then you put it back on. We saw Sephardim are more lenient about that generally. But for Ashkenazim, it has to be in your hand, and that makes it one continuous act. If I took the chalan out, I'm holding it, now I put it back on. Same thing here. It says if you're holding it 
and then you put the psolas back in, that's not considered a violation of Borer. And the example that, it, that he's dealing with is a fascinating one, which the post can talk about a lot, about if you have broken matzah and whole matzah, is there any shaila of Borer there? So what do you think? Do you think is that two minim or one minim? Remember we said Borer only gets off the ground if you're dealing with nuts and berries. So are his broken matzah and whole matzah the same? Ah, very good. So I might have thought that it's the same. We learned from the Ramah that if you have big fish and little fish of the same type of fish, that's called one min, not two min. That's not called a mixture. So broken matzah, whole matzah, on one hand, I might say that it's the same material, so it should be the same. Well, why may you argue differently? Exactly, exactly. So, and that's how the post can generally assume is that fish. A big fish, little fish, it's the same thing. There's no functional difference between them. Okay, one is bigger, one is smaller, but it's the same item. But if you have something, even if it's the same molecules, but there's a functional difference between them. For example, broken matzah and whole matzah. Whole matzah is a lot more valuable than broken matzah. Because the whole matzah you use for lecha mishnah, broken matzah you can just use during the meal. So uh, that would be called two meaning. And therefore, by matzah, if, you're taking, if you have a box of matzah, you have to be careful. Don't take the bad ones out of the box and leave the good ones for the Seder. Rather, take the good ones out and leave the bad ones. Or, as we we're talking about now, take the bad ones out, hold on to them while you're getting the good ones in the box arranged, and then put them back into the box. And that's okay, too. But Borer could apply. Yeah, yeah, specifically on Shabbos. Yeah, on Yantif, this wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be an issue, the, this particular halacha, absolutely. Okay, um, great. And same thing, they tell you, let's say you have a coat that's piled on other coats, right? So is there an issue of, of borer? So you want to get to the coat on the bottom. So A, you might argue that there's no issue of borer there, just like the onion peel, right? It can only get to the onion by taking the peel off. So we said that's not a violation of solas mitoch ocha. But on top of that, we would say if you take the coats and you keep it in your hand and you put them back down, that further uh, alleviates any sort of problem because you haven't done borer. Borer means you took it and you put it down somewhere else. The bad thing. Okay, let's talk just very quickly. Last point on Hilchos Borer for now. There's definitely more to talk about in Hilchos Borer, but from, from what we're going to be covering, these are definitely the essentials and the foundation of it, no question, is uh, taking us again, another Chazara piece tonight, of all the way back, the very first thing we discussed in Simen Shin Yurchas, Maise Shabbos. Maise Shabbos, are you allowed to benefit from Borer if it was done illicitly on Shabbos? Does anybody remember what's the basic halacha of Maise Shabbos? Am I allowed if somebody does malacha on Shabbos? Are they allowed to benefit? Are other people allowed to benefit on Shabbos itself? Now this goes way, way back. If it was amazing, then probably you wouldn't be able to do it uh, even forever. If it was Beshogeg, then you can probably do it um, uh, depend, uh, right after Shabbos. You can benefit from it. Uh, and, for, and everybody else could benefit from it right away. Right, right after Shabbos. In other words, well, the, the simple, simple way to remember it is the way we pass in Halach. It's a three-way machlok is tanoim. It appears all over Shas, you know, in multiple sugyas. But we pass in, like the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, that on Shabbos, if a malacha was done, no one is allowed to benefit from it on Shabbos itself. Whether it was Bishogeg, whether it was Bemezid, whether it was you, whether it was me, it doesn't matter. On Shabbos, hands off. At, right after Shabbos, everyone is allowed to benefit from it. The one exception being, if it was bemazid, then the perpetrator may never benefit from it, like you were saying, Avery. So if it's bemazid after Shabbos, then uh, the perpetrator may not. And some say the one who he did it for as well. Right? We saw that uh, the Ksav Sofer, if he does it professionally, habitually. But um, that's, that's the basic halacha. And so the Ber Halacha writes here that at the beginning of Shin Yerchas, that the bit from the Prima Gavim, that if one does Borer on Shabbos, one is not allowed to benefit from it, right? Because you've improved that item. You know, you've now, you had berries and nuts, and now you have just berries, or you have fewer nuts and berries, and therefore you've improved it, and neither of them uh, may be eaten on Shabbos. Maisa Shabbos applies to Borer. And then a fascinating chiddush they bring from the Ketzos HaShulchan, that uh, what if you take the item, and now you want to rectify it? You say, oh, he did Borer, so he wants to just mix it back up. Does that solve all the problems of Maisa Shabbos? So right now, what was that? Yeah, once it, once it was done, it was done, as Dr. Mark says. At that moment that you took the min shena rotsa, the one that you don't want, 
you already violated bar. Once you did it, so limkomo di sura de avar avar. What what does it help if you already took the nuts out of the berries and then say, oh, I'm not allowed to do that on Shabbos. Let me mix them back in. They've both become intrinsically prohibited at the moment that you did it. And so that's an interesting uh, halacha that even if you rectify, you're still not allowed to eat it on Shabbos. So we learned in the first one that you plant the seed, you're not immediately causing issue because doesn't need to grow. So isn't this kind of the same thing where I separated things, but nobody's really got it these extra stuff. Berries and nuts separated in two bowls. And if I combine them back together, it's as if nothing had ever happened. There's no, there's no better, there's opportunity to benefit. So that, that's the issue, I think. Adam asks, wasn't, isn't it true that nobody actually benefited? Like maybe the malacha hasn't fully been completed on some level because once you separate them, you could always mix them together if nobody's eaten from it yet. But the, the issue is, is that fundamentally, this item from its perspective has been fixed. You know, you've cleaned it out of all nuts, even though now you're going to mix it back, it's been ra'oi for achila, it's suitable to be eaten easily, and therefore that's called a tikkun. As opposed to by planting, for example, where the malacha may not even begin until after Shabbos, right? It may be, uh, you know, it takes a few days to begin to take root. And the whole thing that we can't benefit, that if I separate my power, whoops, it shouldn't have done that. It's good to get it unintentionally. Ah, so very good. So if it's unintentional, remember we said the basic halacha of Rabbi Yehuda is you're still not allowed to benefit on Shabbos. But we saw the Mishnah Bura in Shin Yerches, he says from the Vilna Gon, that if there's a tzorech gadol, if there's a big need, then in cases of shogig, if it was inadvertent, we'll let you benefit from it on Shabbos. So if somebody did borer and they have a lot of guests coming and they say, oh my God, I can't believe I just did this. Well, they're allowed to benefit from it if there's a big need. Remember we, we saw Tzorech Gadol, there was a, a Shaila, Reb Chaim Kanievsky is hot shalant considered a Tzorech Gadol or not. How do you define? It's not always clear what a, what a big need is. But so Tzorech Gadol, a big need is relevant if it was done by shogig on Shabbos. Yeah, I, I don't know. If you did it for Shogig and you're going to be relying on that leniency of Tzorech Gadol to use it on Shabbos for your guests, let's say, uh, do you have to remix that? I don't think so. I think we'd say that you can now just go ahead and, and rely on it. Yeah, good question. Okay. Now, Shemir Shabbos also adds that uh, in source number 57, that in is Brera Elen Kain Hu Miskaven Livro, that this is the prohibition of borer only applies if one intended to do borer, if, if your intent was to separate. I have a bowl of fruit and I want to take out the rotten fruit so I have only good ones left. That's called borer. So when we talk about borer b'shogig, it means I know exactly what I'm doing. I just didn't know that it was not allowed. I forgot that I'm not allowed to do it on Shabbos. But what about the case, he says, of a different type of inadvertent, where I took it out, I thought it was a good fruit. I said, oh, it's, uh, it's rotten, and I put it to the side. Is that called borer b'shogig? Because I, I ended up taking what I didn't want? Very, very good. Adam said, it's very similar to the concept of misasik, right? Misasik, right? I'm leaning against the wall, and I turn on the light switch by accident. It's not that I turned on the light switch thinking I'm allowed to. I didn't even mean to do the action at all. This might be more like misasik, exactly. So the Shemir Shabbos says that's not called borer at all. And that doesn't invoke this penalty of benefiting from it on Shabbos. So if you did borer by accident, you took the wrong one, that's okay. It's only if you meant to take the bad ones out and say, oh, I'm not allowed to do that. Then we say better not to eat it on Shabbos if you can. But if you need to, there, there's what to rely on. Okay, and then they bring a nice, uh, just little machshava piece. We actually said something similar to this earlier, but uh, they say, we can suggest that the halachas of Borer convey a very powerful message for day-to-day -day life. Life is a mixture of good and bad experiences, and our goal is to remove the ochel from the psolas, to be able to focus on and benefit from the good in our life rather than the bad. Additionally, we should immediately focus on the good in our life, miyad. Don't wait around for things to improve. And lastly, we should personally find and identify the good in our life. Yeah, we shouldn't try to figure out the good based on some other intermediary that doesn't accurately reflect what we should be feeling, the kli, like a kli. We should use our yeah, do it directly. And alavai, we should be zochet for that. Okay, so that is Hilchos Borer in a nutshell, right? That it's, uh, yeah, no pun intended. And uh, mm -hmm. complicated, a lot of issues, but the big principle, the reason why Borer is is somewhat containable. You know, it's a big topic, but we're able to kind of condense it is because it really 
hinges on these three principles. If you know those three principles very well of Ochel mitoch psolas, biyad, and miyad, almost everything we discussed is somehow connected to one of those three things. And that's a helpful way for us to remember it, to store it in your memory, is just linking everything to one of those three concepts. And uh, hopefully we can take it with us. Yeah, exactly. So now that, that brings us to uh, the home stretch here, which is Simon Shin Chaf, juicing fruits on Shabbos, squeezing um, to extract liquids from, from fruit on Shabbos. This, by the way, is a prohibition on Shabbos for sure. And it's relevant right now for us as well to think about it's a, it may be a prohibition in Hilchot Shemitah. There's a big discussion in Hilchot Shemitah. Are you allowed to take a fruit that has Kedusha Shviz and to squeeze it for its juice? Big discussion. Is that allowed? Because the fruit of Shemitah are considered to be very holy. And you have to treat them with a lot of respect and you have to consume them in the normal way that they're consumed. So there's a big discussion, as we'll see in Hilchot Shabbos also, about is squeezing the, the fruit considered its normal means of consumption or an abnormal means which would be prohibited? for a Shemitah in Eretz Israel, just as an aside. But we're focusing on the halachas of schita, of uh, squeezing on Shabbos. And remember, we've seen that in, in Hilfa Shabbos, there really are two different types of squeezing that are fundamentally different. One is what we learned earlier in the laws of Melaben. Remember with Melaben, laundering, there are three stages to the prohibition. Any one of them violates the Torah prohibition. Anybody remember what they were? It's like, a, like the same as a washing machine cycle. So the first one was soaking, or right? shriya, so you're not allowed to, to soak a garment. Shriya sozuo kibusa. Second one was shif shuf, yeah, rubbing it down. And then the third one was ringing, right, ringing it out. And um, that, that type of ringing, that type of sfita is considered to be a, a type of malabin, right? It's like you have the, wa the dirty water in it, if you will, and you're extracting out the dirty water from this shirt. That's cleaning the shirt if you squeeze it out. That's one prohibition of squeezing. That's enhancing the garment. But then the other type, which is totally different in terms of the halachos, is what we call mefarek. Mefarek, which is uh, like squeezing berries for their juice. It's also a form of extracting liquid from something else. But this type is, is totally different. This comes from the malacha of dash. Dash, which is threshing. Threshing. So um, how does this come up? So the Orcha Shabbos in source number two, this defines the malacha of dash. Again, dash is threshing. So you have like a grain and you have chaff, right? And you want to separate um, the kernel from the, the chaff around it, from the parts that you're not going to eat. So it, just like in the Mishkan, they would do that to separate the kernel from the chaff. So to separating the juice from the grape is kind of like the same thing. That's what the rabbis say. And therefore, that's also a Torah prohibition. It's a tolda. But they say, this is kind of the same thing. We look at the paradigm, the Av, and we figure out the Tolda as well. And so what's the problem of extracting? So if you take a look at Yorcha Shabbos in source number two, he writes, Mishum shehamitz hayotze mehazesim v'hanavim yesh lo shem mashke. Because you are creating a new status to something. You're changing a food, right? A grape is a food, and now you're creating a liquid, right? The liquid was in there but it was absorbed in it, it was contained in it. Now that you're freeing it, you are creating, you're bringing to life, if you will, this, uh, this liquid, shem mashke. You're creating something new. There was no grape, there was no grape juice until you squeezed it, right? And the Mishnah in Masech HaShav is Davkuf Mem Gimel in source number one tells us, just so we see it inside, you're not allowed to squeeze fruit in order to extract juices. Remember, we saw the concept of squeezing juice, squeezing grapes. We saw that once before also, way back a year ago, in uh, the Gemara Baba Basra and Nafsadi Zayin, when we talked about grape juice for Kiddush, where we said the Gemara says, Sochet Adam Eshkel Shelanavim, Omer Alav Kiddush Ayom. And we say you're allowed to squeeze grapes on Friday, not on Friday night, Friday morning to make uh, Kiddush on grape juice. And that was our big discussion. We said, is that really so simple to make Kiddush on grape juice nowadays? But uh, here we, we see explicitly that on Shabbos itself, you would not be allowed to. And the Gemara here makes clear on Nafkuf Memhei that when it comes to squeezing fruit on Shabbos, there are three levels of the prohibition. We often find this in Hilfah Shabbos. There's, you know, red, yellow, and green, as we've said. 
So the worst, the Isser Midah Araisa, the Gemara, the Mishnah, and the Gemara say, actually only applies to two fruit, to Zesim and Anavim. You only violate the Torah prohibition of squeezing juice out of a fruit if you squeeze olives or grapes. Why? Anybody think why would, what's so special about those two types of fruit being squeezed? Yeah, you're very good. Those liquids have a special status, right? Is that what you're saying, Neil? Yeah, and that, exactly. Grape juice gets a special bracha. And there is an opinion. Uh, 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 Shemin Zai is a big discussion. What's the bracha on it? Because the Gemara says in Ketzal Mubarakim that it's mazik. So maybe you don't make any bracha. But in theory, it could also have gotten a special bracha, at least a bracha of ha'etz rather than a shahakal, perhaps. But uh, th these two, what? And it was used in the Mishkan. Both of them were, right? Exactly. For the, the libations, they used uh, wine. And for the menorah, they used oil. And for the menachos, they used oil. So absolutely, these two liquids have a special status in halacha. And therefore, those two, the Ran explains, are uniquely the Torah prohibition because they're called especially a new creation, if you will. Now, I'll just point out, not everybody agrees. Some say these are two examples of fruit that are commonly squeezed. But we're going to go with the opinion of the Ran that no, it's only those two because wine and grape juice, or wine and oil, I'm sorry, have a unique status that you're creating something significantly new. What about if you squeeze other fruits? So this is level two. The Gemara calls tusim virimoni. What if I squeeze strawberries or pomegranates for their juice? So those are things that are commonly squeezed, where people like to drink a strawberry juice, pomegranate juice, orange juice would be included in that, pineapple juice, anything that's commonly squeezed for juice, but it's not those two big ones, is going to be midirabana. That's going to be a rabbinic prohibition. And then the Gemara has a third category. What's left? We talked about uh, so we say anything that is never squeezed for juice, something that is just very, very uncommon, it's so unusual to squeeze this for its juice, you're allowed to do that on shots. But there's no prohibition, even rabbinically, to be extracting the juice from that. So anybody think of examples? Of, what would be sharp arrows? What are things that never get squeezed for their juice? Oh, uh, so yeah, well, first of all, maybe not a fruit, like maybe onions. I mean, you know, you don't squeeze for onion juice, but some say that even uh, watermelon might be included in that, or cantaloupe, though, like you, know, you never find cantaloupe juice. Something so unusual that if you were to squeeze cantaloupe for its juice on Chavez, it would be totally mutter, some say. Um, but so those are the three categories. Category one is the biblical, the, the worst one to do, which is grapes or olives. Category two is anything else that's regularly squeezed for its juice pomegranates, strawberries, oranges, pineapples, apples, and the like. And then category three is something that's never squeezed for its juice, and that is completely, completely mutter. So you can't squeeze a lemon with your hand into the salad? Ah, well, I'll have to talk about it. In theory, not. In theory, that should be a problem based on what we learned. Right? Adam asked, are you, so you're not allowed to squeeze a lemon into a salad? We'll have to see. There may be a special, there is a special leniency for that. But in theory, it should be a problem because a lemon is frequently squeezed for its juice, lemon juice. And therefore, what level is squeezing a lemon? Is that a Torah prohibition, rabbinic, or rabbinic, rabbinic prohibition? We assume. Again, there is an opinion of Rashi. Rashi assumes that anything that's very commonly squeezed is the oraisa, just grapes and olives are examples. Anything that's kind of commonly squeezed is the rabban, and anything that's never squeezed is the is mutter. We'll assume not that way. Okay. Now, there's an additional prohibition we have to know about. Not only are you not allowed to squeeze, liquid out of uh, berries and, and fruit on Shabbos. Take a look at the Mishnah there in source number one. It continues to be, what's the halacha if juice seeps out on its own, if it comes out on its own on Shabbos? So to have, you know, a barrel of strawberries and at the bottom, some of the juice is getting extracted during Shabbos inadvertently. Asuri, the Tanakhama says, you're not allowed to drink that strawberry juice if it came out on Shabbos even by itself. Or let's say that, that grape juice, that, that oil. Rabbi Huda Amer im la'ochlin hayotz mehen mutter v'im la'mashkin hayotz mehen asr. Rabbi Huda disagrees, which we'll see in, in a little bit. So um, we have this additional rabbinic prohibition that if liquid comes out on its own from fruit on Shabbos, I'm not allowed to drink it. Uh, why? Yeah. Why do you think? What's the problem? I didn't do anything wrong. The grapes are sitting here, and they just there's no ma'isa. There's no ma. Yeah, so clearly, this is not ma'isa Shabbos, right? Ma'isa Shabbos was learned as if somebody violated Shabbos, I can't benefit from it. That's not this because nobody violated Shabbos here. It happened on its own. Yeah, day. 
ah, we're going to talk about that. That that's similar, but not exactly the same as here. That's an issue of moldy, perhaps, or no leprosy of mashing ice up on Shabbos. But here it's actually it's a, a holy day. day. Ah, very good. It's it's a holy day. You might come to squeeze. So this is what the Gemara calls mashkin shezavu. A mashkin shezavu, meaning a liquid that came out on its own. What's the rabbi said? We don't want you drinking that grape juice from the, the bottom of the of the bowl that came out from the grapes on its own, because you might come if you said, "Hey, this is pretty good." You might come to squeeze the grape, and that's a Torah prohibition. So, because it, it could lead you to squeeze the grape if it came out before Shabbos, the Gemara says in Shabbos and Dafitas, then that's okay. But then we're not worried. But if it came out on Shabbos itself, uh, you're not allowed to to drink it. There is an opinion of the Shulchan Aruch Harav that this is mukta. Not just that you're not allowed to drink; you're not even allowed to move it. But uh, most post can Rabbi Kveger and others disagree, and they say, you know, that you're just not allowed to drink it on Shabbos, the liquid that came out. So again, we have two prohibitions here, one potential biblical and one that's always rabbinic. The potential biblical one is if I actively squeeze it. Why do I say potential? Because it depends, what am I squeezing? If I squeeze uh, grapes or olives, it's a Torah prohibition. If anything else, it's rabbinic or allowed. But the rabbinic prohibition is if the liquid seeps out. However, the Gemara clarifies and says, well, well, let me take a step back. You might be wondering, what difference does it make if it's Torah, rabbinic? Why do I care? What's the difference between squeezing grapes on Shabbos or squeezing strawberries? At the end of the day, if you ask him, am I allowed to do it? I say no and no. So what difference should it make if it's mid arais or if it's mid rabana? Okay, in the olden days, it made a difference. But now, you know, in terms of a korban or whatever, nowadays, what's the difference? I just tell me, am I allowed or am I not allowed? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, so the punishment, you know, back then would have been a, yeah, exactly the punishment. You're right; they still could be curious nowadays. You're absolutely it's the right. gather of how you could be moderate. What was that? The gather on how you could potentially be moderate. That's another one. So, to one point, the ruin says just to know the punishment. You know, are we dealing with a potential very serious punishment or not? The other is what Rabbi says as well is. Whenever you're asked to shyla on something and you have to figure out what's the halacha, well, you want to know what level are we dealing with? If we're dealing with a Torah prohibition, we're going to be more cautious than a rabbinic prohibition. Still have to be cautious, but we'll be less so. You know, in case of a suffix, we can be more lenient by a rabbinic prohibition. Absolutely. And then there's another difference between them, much more local to this issue, regarding this gezerah, this rabbinic prohibition on don't drink juices that seep out on their own. Don't, don't, the rabbi said, we don't want you because you might come to squeeze them. So here we find the difference, halacha, based on, on the Shakla Vatari of the Gemara, that the Shulchan Aruch makes clear, the Mishnah Bura really spells out, that um, when it comes to grapes and olives, which themselves are the Arisa, because there you're dealing with fire, like that's the worst prohibition, they're the most dangerous in this sugya, then their juice or their oil will always be prohibited if it seeps out, no matter what, on Shabbat. Because we're dealing with the potential the Arisa, the rabbis prohibited everything that comes out of it. When it comes to other fruit, there we have to ask the question, which the Mishnah was already alluding to, is what are these fruit being used for in the first place? If these are fruit that are be, being used for achila, where I would normally be eating it, then we don't have to be goza. Then if the liquid came out on its own, I'm allowed to benefit from it. But if these are fruit that would normally be used for squeezing, then if the liquid comes out, I'm not allowed to benefit. Because there I'm in danger of coming to squeeze the strawberry, or to squeeze... Uh, the blueberry, to squeeze the pineapple. Everybody get the difference? So the fact that one is the Arisa and one is the Rabbanan is practical in terms of Onish, in terms of Suffolk, but it's also practical in terms of this secondary rabbinic act. How far did they go? When it comes to grapes and olives, they outlawed everything that comes out of them on Shabbos, even if on its own. When it comes to the other fruit, which are only rabbinic to begin with, so if it comes out of a fruit that would be used for squeezing, then you're not allowed to eat it. But if it's coming out of a fruit that you would have been eating anyways, then you are allowed to be, to be eating it. So what, um, how does this come up? Let's, let's look at a few practical examples of that. But before we do, just very briefly, the Shemir Shabbos Kilchas in source number three makes a very important point, Halacha Lamaisa. Remember we said that there are three categories of fruit. There is the Araisa squeezing, there's the Rabbanon squeezing, and there's Mutter squeezing. So he said Mutter is for things that are Totally not, not squeezed at all for juice. As Shemir Shabbos writes that uh, in the footnote here, in source number three, that Ela um, Shekayom, 
Regilim Liskot Komine Peros. He says he thinks that this third category may not really exist anymore. He says nowadays, like everything is squeezed. So it could be that in the times of the mission, the times of the Gemara, maybe uh, you know pineapple juice wasn't a big thing back then. Who knows? You know, maybe those were com completely allowed. That was category three. But he says nowadays everything is juiced, and therefore almost everything is going to be included in category two of things that are juiced but that are not grapes or olives, and therefore every other thing will be a dirabanan as opposed to the daraisa. As I mentioned, though, there's still maybe some exceptions. Like I said, even nowadays, some folks can say that watermelon, cantaloupe, certainly onions, like those are just never juiced, and they do still exist as a, a relic of level three of mutter, but uh, most fruit will fall into category two. We generally, for effect, all effective purposes, assume that there are two categories, grapes and olives being category one, everything else being category two for pitten midrava. Watermelon juice. Do, do people drink watermelon juice? It's funny. I, I thought that people do. I mean, it, it sounded like something that uh, apricot juice. Have you ever seen? But it, yeah, have you ever seen? Is that something? Yeah. People nowadays do everything. Yeah. Yeah. Watermelon and vodka. Is it something that's somewhat uh, somewhat done, or is it really just a one person in his backyard somewhere is doing it? Yeah. Okay, so let, let's make this very practical with a few examples, and then we'll, we'll finish. One is uh, the issue comes up all the time. You go for Shabbos lunch, and the first course is uh, grapefruit. Are you allowed to eat grapefruit on Shabbos? So what's the potential issue? Squeezing, right? When you put your spoon into it, you know, it squirts juice out of there. Is that a problem of sfita? So Reb Shlomo Zalman in source number four from the Shmura Shabbos Kehochasa. So for the they pass him, Mutter Lachtov. You're allowed to cut a grapefruit in half and to eat it with a spoon on Shabbos. So, ah, isn't that a problem of schita? Aren't you extracting? What, what do people think? What? It's derech achila. You're just getting food out. Yeah, and that's, I think, what, what Avi said as well. It's derech achila. You're just, this is eating. You're not doing it to extract the juice. But shouldn't it still be rabbinically prohibited? Shouldn't it still be maybe a psik resha? <laughs> Is it guaranteed to happen? I'm saying it's not guaranteed, so maybe it's just a Dabr Shem exactly. So yeah, Rav Shlomo Zalman thought that there were a number of reasons why we could be lenient to allow eating a grapefruit on Shabbos. So the conclusion may not be that astounding, but it's good to know why. Next year, time you're having grapefruit on Shabbos, you can explain to people why, why is this okay? So uh, I think many of the points we've said already. One is to begin with, are we talking about a potential Torah prohibition or a potential rabbinic prohibition? with the juice coming out of a grapefruit. Rabbinic, yeah, it's not grapes, it's not olives. Okay, so to begin with, we're rabbinic, like we said, that's important to know. We're already on more safe ground than if you were asking me the same question about eating an actual grape like that. Okay, and then two, we said the juicing is performed with a shinoid, since you're using a spoon. This isn't the normal way of juicing. And I think that's what Raniel was getting at, that this isn't yeah, juicing, you're eating, right? Then this isn't the normal way of juicing. Three, you don't intend it to juice it, right? This isn't your kavana at all. Right. And it's Durabanan, and it's Kilacharyad, he says. So he says, Shari Bishbihi Agavna Sharina betrayed Durabanan the Psi Gracia. So he says, even if this is a Psi Gracia, remember we saw the concept before that if they're trade Durabanan and a Psi Gracia, if it's guaranteed to happen, but there are two different rabbinic prohibitions going on, we discussed this when it came to destroying letters, right, on the cake, and, and that, that's again. So if there's two Durabanans, maybe we can, uh, we can be lenient there as well. And then finally, he says, uh, you're not even being my friend. There's no, maybe you could argue that the question doesn't get off the ground, even if you want to assume that this is juicing and whatnot, because the juice gets reabsorbed. And he says, a lot of juice, you know, it gets reabsorbed into the fruit some of the time. And therefore, maybe it's not even called extracting. That's similar to the argument we saw when it came to wearing wet socks. When we said, we're wearing wet socks, aren't I squeezing out the water when I'm walking, but it gets reabsorbed right away. So maybe that's not called squeezing out. That was, you know, the other type of squeezing of uh, malavin. Neil, you, you know, I mean, we get great from the seven shavites from the trees, but as soon as you cut it, you're producing juice, the whole. And once you finish scooping out, there's a tendency to want to squeeze it and get whatever goes in the juice. Ah, very good. So do we have to be concerned? Next one about drinking the juice because you might come to squeeze it out. I'm tempted to squeeze it. Uh -huh. uh, I want to get every drop. Every drop, uh-huh. So yeah, so do we have to prohibit the, the liquid? Remember we said when 
when there's liquid that comes out of fruit on Shabbos, we're not allowed to eat it. That was the second issue we always have to address, the rabbinic. So here, Rabbi Shalom Lozano says that's not a problem either because the fruit was set aside to be eaten, not for the purpose of juicing. Right, so if, the, if you had a stash of um, you know, strawberries that you were going to be using to make a, a smoothie you know, on Mose Shabbos to squeeze them out, and they're there in your kitchen, you see, oh, some juice came out of them, I'm just going to have the juice. That you're not allowed to do because that you might come to squeeze more. But the grapefruit is there for eating. And we said anything that's for eating, if it comes from the category two, which is only rabbinic to begin with, even if I were to squeeze it out, it's only rabbinic prohibition, then the juice that comes out is not prohibited. So this is a great example of that, how you're allowed to eat the leftover juice. Similar example, they bring, what about watermelon juice leftover in a bowl? Usually if you're eating watermelon, there's going to be some juice at the bottom of the bowl. Are you allowed to drink that? What do you think? Is that prohibited? Midah araisa, midah or allowed? Yeah, why? Oh, so what, well, what if there is fruit left in the bowl? Adam says, maybe it should be allowed if there's no fruit left in the bowl. We're not afraid you're going to squeeze it out. But let's say there's still some fruit left, but I want to take some of the juice. I'm going to scoop it up to drink it. Ah, exactly. Because the fruit is there, because we're dealing with category two, not category one. So not grapes or olives. So we're only in category two. We said there, we only outlaw the residual juice that comes out if it's the type of fruit that you would be using for squeezing. But if it's a fruit that was there for eating, we don't need to be so strict on the juice itself. Excellent. Okay, and then last example for tonight is uh, what about a fruit salad? It's a fascinating shot that both we discuss, which is, um, let's say you have a, a fruit salad that has a lot of different fruit in it, including grapes. So first of all, let's say without grapes. If it's just other fruit like oranges and apples and pears, and there's some juice, of course you can have it, right? Because the fruit are there for eating, therefore their juice is not prohibited, the juice that came out on its own. But what about if there are grapes in a salad? Now it's an interesting question. Let's say some of the grape juice drips to the bottom also, and you have this mixture of juice including grape juice. So now we have an interesting question. What's, why is it an interesting question? Does special dishishim apply? Exactly, because, well, first of all, the, grape, the juice that comes out of a grape, we said, is always prohibited to be drunk on shabbos, because there you're playing with fire. If you squeeze a grape, that's a Torah prohibition. So even if it's a grape that's only there for eating and not for squeezing, the juice that happens to come out on its own is prohibited. That rabbinic edict always applies to grapes. And so you're not allowed to have the grape juice. And then we have an interesting question. We say, well, wait a second. At the if it was just a grape salad and I have just grape juice at the bottom, it's clear. I can't, I'm not allowed to drink it. But if I have all these other fruits mixed with grapes, and at the bottom, now that I empty out, I see there's just juice at the bottom that has some grape juice in it, but also some apple juice and some orange juice. So now what do we do? Ah, very good. So we seemingly we should say this should be bato bashishim. Maybe even bato barov, perhaps. With the color of bato bashishim, because it's different tastes. So uh, we say that if you have 60 times, it could be nullified, but there may be an issue here. And it, uh, this gets into a Yoradea sugya of there's certain times where we do not apply the principle of bittel, where something could get nullified. We have a little bit of grape juice, but a lot of other juices. So we say, ignore the grape juice as if it's not there. Good, good question. Adam says, is this a problem of what we call you're not allowed to rely on this principle of bittel deliberately to engineer a situation like that. So the post can write that that only applies if you're deliberately doing it for that sake. But if I'm doing something else and it happens to occur, then even if it's inevitable, that would be considered okay. Yeah, very good question. So I have this juice, this mixture of juices at the bottom. Do we say bittel? Do we say that the grape juice is nullified in the juice of everything else uh, to be able to uh, to permit it? So here this gets in. Ruben? I don't know. I guess I'm having a problem uh, you know, just uh, considering the concept of bittel when it comes to local shops. Because, uh, you know, I mean, it's one thing when you're talking about, you know, you're talking about, you know, you know, because you know, you're eating, but local shops, it's a. So to me, I don't know how the concept of it you know, applies, you know, because either the the action is, is prohibited or the action is mutter or, you know, whatever that consideration is. So yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, I, I hear where you're coming from. Ruben says that maybe uh, the whole concept of bittel shouldn't apply in the realm of Shabbos. It applies to things that are kosher or non-kosher, but applying to mutter or usr, maybe it shouldn't. But it's interesting, the halacha seems to apply it across the board. In, in all areas, we, in most areas of halacha, we apply bittal. But you're totally right. It, intuitively, you could have distinguished between them. 
But the, the Gemara brings examples of bittul when it comes to muktza, for example, or, or other things as well, even though it's not kosher, non-kosher. So the question is, so there is one exception, there are a few exceptions, but one major exception to the principle of bittul, so the Gemara discusses in Beitz and Nav Gimel, which is called a davar sheyesh l'matir, which means if I have something that is totally treif and something that's totally kosher, yeah, then we say bittul. Like if pig falls into my chalun, I'll never be able to eat this chalun. Pig is always treif. Okay, we say bittul because there's so much chalun, just a little bit of pork that fell in. But what if I have something that is not kosher now or not edible now, but if I wait a little bit, it'll become okay. Do we apply bittul there? So that's what the Gemara calls a davar shiyeshna matir, and something that's not forever prohibited, it's just prohibited for a little time. And if you wait it out, it'll become mutter. So the Lashon of Rashi there is, uh, It says, why do you have to rely on this loophole, not a loophole, but for our purposes, we'll call it a loophole of bittel. Why do you have to rely on that kula of bittel? Just wait another five hours until Shabbos is over, and then you could have the grape juice then. There's no prohibition to have it grape juice that came out on Saturday night to wait until Saturday night and have it. It's just on Shabbos that it's not allowed. So because if you waited a few more hours, it would become permissible, the Gemara says we don't apply bittel to something like that. And even if you have a million times the item, we still say that it's in Obatel. Just wait. Why do you have to wait and rely on bittel, Rashi says? Just wait until after Shabbos and, and have it then. And so it could be, now this gets into complicated issues of Davar Sheish Should that really apply in this case? One could ask. For, for a variety of reasons, but uh, some posts can bring that as a concern, and they say that maybe Dabar Shish Lamatirin would, uh, would apply. But the posts can say that if the grape juice came in and was never visible, so it was immediately absorbed into the juice, you know, it never like was collecting on the side and came in, but it, it didn't have its own independent existence. I just see juice at the bottom, and oh, there's grape juice in there, Mistama, then maybe we don't apply Dabar Shish Lamatirin, maybe it would be allowed. But uh, just good to know that, the, and some say that in general, there's no issue of, uh, uh, of Dabr Shisha Matirin here, but Apashtus is uh, that one, one could be Machmir. So what do we see? That the juice that comes out of a grape on its own is different than the juice that comes out of other fruit other than an olive. Grapes and olives are in their own category. And if you have a mixture of juices that contains grape juice or uh, olive oil in it, you're going to have a little bit more of a problem, even when it comes to bittel, even if you wanted to nullify it in the other fruit, because this is something you could just wait a few hours and eat it then. Don't, uh, why do you have to rely on it and eat it now? Anybody remember where we saw Dabar Shisha Matirin once before? Yeah, I, I can only remember one, one time. It may, may have been more, but I remember one specific in Hilchos Muktza. I think we talked about it in a fascinating case of a bus is the Dabar Hasar. I think we saw, it was a real life case where somebody lit ha uh, Hanukkah candles or, or Shabbos candles somewhere in a hotel on a chair and then they said that maybe that chair became a busis, where even though the candles went out, the next morning the, the chair is still prohibited, right? Because it had mukta on it at the start of Shabbos. And I said, okay, well, maybe the chair gets batel, maybe it's mavutel in all the other chairs in the shul, in the hotel. And I said, it's not so simple because mukta is a devashesha matirin. And maybe then we wouldn't be allowed to apply bitl there. We said, ah, maybe you could argue it wasn't a busis because Rabbi Natam holds that for busis it has to be the intent for it to be there all of Shabbos, not just during Ben Hashemashos. But, uh, okay, I hope you don't mind that I throw in uh, these Chazari tidbits. I just think it's a helpful way to keep it in our mind so we don't lose it. Just as many times as we can find some excuse to bring it up, it helps us to, uh, to hold on to it. So uh, with that, we'll pause here uh, in the fascinating world of, of squeezing juice uh, out of fruit. And in Ritz next week, we'll uh, continue with uh, some very practical applications and exceptions to this rule, like what Adam was asking about the, the salad case of uh, squeezing them. Everyone should have a wonderful week. And uh, Mr. Shim will pick it up. Okay. Is, is, are there any examples where uh, the situation is a little